Here we go. This call is now being recorded. So uh, to get started with this week's call, I um, wanted to bring up an idea that uh, we've sort of been talking about internally for a while now. Um, we we want to potentially start incorporating funding into Research Hub somehow. And so we're thinking about like a bunch of different models um, all the way from sort of what experiment.com did, which basically like did a Kickstarter for research to like some of these new web three models where like, um, what's it, uh, BitCloud, where there's essentially like a marketplace of creator tokens based on someone's like Twitter presence um, to uh, the example that I posted in the community channel um, a couple of days ago of the Australian professor who's essentially trying to like raise 15K by minting a token and then having that token receive a profit share of NFTs that come out of a research project. Um, yeah, this to me is like super interesting because I'll share my screen here just to like go over this guy's proposal. Um, the idea here is that he's a quantum physics professor who just needs time on like some kind of supercomputer. And so he doesn't need a whole lot of like resources to conduct his experiment. He just needs to fund the time on this supercomputer. And so he's raising three ETH with his just under uh, 15K and is minting a token associated with it that will essentially allow everybody who owns it to proportionally receive uh, like sales, like the profits of sales of an NFT, which is going to be the figures from the paper he eventually publishes. Um, to me, this is like pretty cool because it's like just an organic person, you know, who we don't know, who is personally experimenting with funding research using tokens. So always a good sign to see people like bootstrapping that. But um, yeah, I guess for this like first per uh, portion of the community call, I'd love to kind of hear everybody's thoughts about this, both positive and negative, and then eventually scope that out to like talk a little bit about how we're envisioning a funding feature potentially being built. Do you guys think this is like a good or a bad idea? Do you think you'll end up getting the three? I think we should help them try it there. Just if, if anything, just so we can see how it plays out. I'm, I'm curious to know who the people funding are. Like, are these guys? Ethereum people? Are they scientists? Like, who are these people? I could do a couple of them, and I think they're like uh, uh, crypto people, mostly. Yeah. Like, this was brought to uh, my attention by like a crypto VC who was like, "Oh, like this is pretty cool. You guys should check this out." Yeah. So, so a couple of these people, um, like this guy, he's a, a another researcher who uh, is minting like quantum computing uh, NFTs. I think he's like a, a researcher slash uh, designer. So there's like some kind of quantum coherence happening in the movement there. Um, but yeah, apparently a community of NFT crypto people, essentially. Is Brian so, like it? Sorry. Um, is the idea maybe if the goal is not reached for Research Hub to sponsor uh, like till the end, so they also get promotions out of it? What we have been kind of toying around with is the idea of like a, a Patreon using uh, Research Coin potentially, where researchers could say, "Hey, like." Um, you know, anybody who donates X amount of research coin could get tier one of extra content. And maybe tier two is like a personal call with the research team once a month. And maybe tier three is like IP rights to any knowledge that's produced by the research project. Like th thinking about how researchers can in a Patreon style way um, help incentivize like their community members to uh, give funding. But one thing I'm curious to hear from Anton and Philip and Dragon as well, but especially Anton is like, is 
like I'm not sure how common it is for like science that's produced, especially papers and labs, to then like jump into something where someone in industry, a company, uses that research, you know, to do something. And then like are the labs compensated somehow? They just take it free because it's like written out in open public in a paper, you know, like do you roughly does anybody roughly understand how this whole system would work? There are several solutions that people use here. Sometimes it's just a, a grant, right? So if a company wants to get some knowledge, they would just offer a grant, right? They would describe a specific goal in mind. They would offer it to a subset of institutions and they, you know, would either outsource the selection process or do it themselves somehow. So that's one way. Another way would be um, just headhunt the researcher you want, add them to your research and development branch, make them do the research behind the closed doors, right? This way the information is not public so that, you know, you can hide it from competitors. For people to benefit from research in institutions is kind of rare, right? Because people mostly share their stuff and it's like they, they don't they don't keep track of what happens with the knowledge after they shared it right so someone might have read your paper and like oh yeah so that's how we have to make the layout on our website according to this psychological research and then they do and they never attribute right <laughs> i think that's the most common scenario yeah patent your stuff huh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing that I was thinking about the Patreon tiers, right? Because it's a pretty non-typical for research, especially like modern day research to hide some content behind paywalls. That's kind of what would probably be judged by other members of the community. But if it's something, well, we have to think about the connotation or it, it, we'll have to make it something that's not super like valuable, valuable, right? Because if it's super valuable, just share it for free kind of thing. So it might be something that's pleasant, but not essential for the rest of the community. So maybe like Patrick said, joining the lab meeting as a viewer or something. Kind of the, the standard thing that we were thinking uh, to get started would be like, access to the labs ELN so like maybe they're publishing stuff to put out there but then if you want to join their patreon you can see the stuff before it's published as it's getting kind of drafted within the lab so basically like insight into how the lab's working yeah stuff like that also I'm not sure how useful or interesting it would be for like, like like even in this example it's you know quantum computing and it's just uh, you know funded by random crypto guys like how much random crypto guys will be able to make out of incoherent notes <laughs> you know, with inside knowledge from a lab right. one, one thing that i'm wondering too is like um i know a lot of universities have like media departments you know that write like I mean, whenever some paper gets published, that's kind of big or like kind of interesting. They're going to write some plain version of it. How, I don't know, like what's the interaction there between the media, like that media department and the lab itself? Like, is it is it someone just, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is like, is there any benefit in, I mean, let's say someone pays for Patreon style access. I'm not sure a lab would ever hire like a media team to go manage this thing. Um, but is there any kind of like, yeah, instead of just looking at the notes, right? Like someone once a month posts a monthly update, like it's kind of like caters towards general, all the funders, right? I would say that this is probably the solution that will most likely work out of all the other offers, right? Because if it has to be hustle free for the people conducting the research, because, you know, it, it adds another layer of 
problems for you to write notes in a specific way that people outside can read them and then uh, you know get the, this in between preliminary pieces of information that you can share maybe as part of the funding you're right there would be some person involved that would be paid part of it to compile those you know preliminary yeah. pieces of knowledge into something digestible for the general public Um, maybe if a research group uh, doesn't have or isn't willing to post regular updates as they are doing the research and in real time, maybe it would also be worth considering a feature where they post a certain content behind a paywall. So the users on the platform have to contribute, I know, 100 uh, research tokens, and then it becomes publicly available. So it's literally a paywall that gets uh, well, well, goes down uh, when good enough amount of funding is provided, and that way people can just regularly continue to do research and get paid for it and do more research, etc. So that will that probably will get a very unfortunate media attention to you, right? Because you are incentivizing further the opposite of open science, right? I think the the goals that are behind you know behind the paywall they should be justifiable in such a way so for example even the authors themselves like why don't you hate the quantum thing that we just looked at right because the authors themselves don't have the knowledge yet they need help right it's not like they're not greedy they need help that's a very different narrative same here right if you are supporting the lab maybe you get a get you get a say in like they have like free three options for what experiments they're going to do next, right? Experiment one, two, or three, they're equally interesting for them. And then maybe you can vote which ones they pursue first. Stuff like that, maybe it's, you know, more benign, less evil. <laughs> yeah, so basically like uh, fund funding before research instead of after. Yeah, I think it will make a big difference for narrative. So, yeah. Anton, if, so for this like fifteen thousand dollars in theory, which you know a good portion of it's being used on like operating costs of the lab, do you mm -hmm. think that it's reasonable for someone like this to publish monthly updates, whether it's like in a quick blog or even think like a podcast or something where they just take like an hour and explain what they've done over the last month? Um, do you think people would do that for this levels of funding? I'm sure there are some people that would do that. It's like connecting with them. <laughs> Is a problem. Well, I think it was encouraging uh, Dahlia's comment. I don't know if you all saw that in the community mm -hmm. Slack where she's already made NFTs and it's like trying to get funded via these NFTs. I looked her YouTube too. She makes pretty cool content. Like she's got a like a cool uh, like marine biology lab and you know the stuff is pretty. So yeah, I, I wonder if there are enough people out there who would make these NFTs and would provide weekly updates to the point where like if you want to fund them and get this like extra content outside of what they're publishing in their lab you can you can get on the inside and get like a special youtube video that she makes or something yeah yeah, yeah. no there are people for sure that can provide content like this so but i think like the like a main point is also like who is funding these guys is it labs or is it just single people because like if i look at my lab we most of the time are not looking at like paying for knowledge of someone else. We're more looking at like making collabs. And if, if that's not possible, maybe an MTA, uh, and, and like yeah, mostly collaborating. And, and I don't think my PI would really be interested in like gathering. Yeah. The same kind of knowledge we have, like, by giving someone else grants, I, 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 that's, that's yeah. my experience. I think it, it would come from uh, individuals who wanted to like support the work of your lab. So it wouldn't be like a lab doing funding. It would be like mm -hmm. like a, a wealthy person coming and saying, "Hey, Philip's lab, yeah. we want to get a podcast once a month to give them some cash." But then mm -hmm. they would need to decide who gets the money, right? Who is the actual person who gets the money? How do they ensure that they spend it? in a fair way for you know it distributes them among the lab members or they mm -hmm. like there needs to be a budget proposed right and someone needs to approve the budget stuff like that it gets bureaucratic really fast 
that that's where this quantum token like there's no assurances whatsoever like you have no idea whether this guy is just going to take the money and run which mm -hmm. he very well mm -hmm. but also he's got a reputation like i feel like it would be unlikely if he did that you know he's a real person and stuff it's easy to look him up like right. i can message him on linkedin you know um yeah i, I, I wonder so. if we can get away with especially with smaller amounts of funding like not necessarily requiring like you hit checkpoint A, you get funding release B because of mm -hmm. it. You hit point C, you get funding release D. You know, if we could start out with smaller stuff like this, and then eventually, once we build something, scale to like big grants to Philips Lab. You know, where it makes sense for their PI to be to care about. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe like once a grant is over a certain amount, maybe you can like like how grants are awarded these days. Like someone comes to your lab as a quick picture, like. I don't know. Maybe if if like if the grant is worth twenty five or thirty k, maybe you like organize just a single event, like really small. Someone comes to your lab for five minutes, takes a photo, totally. and then you have someone from research, up, for instance, and um, like someone from that lab, and then you know, yeah, it's probably a real person. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's feasible. Of course, it's maybe a bit bigger, but. I don't know. I'm sure people would do that. Like, I know the quantum biology lab that we're talking to, like, they would definitely do something like that for 25 can funding. So, yeah, that's, that, interesting. that's interesting. I feel it. I feel like what you're describing, it almost feels like there needs to be two eras of the funding, right? So, this you're speaking about more like the in five years or in a year, depends on how explosive everything is, right? Where people, where the grants are so big. And the infrastructure is so developed that we can afford to have like reporters who come into the lab and people on the quality control, like actual grant agencies, stuff like that. But maybe during the first time, perhaps maybe you should we should focus on small small amounts and no strings attached. Why? Because no one will be able to enforce those strings attached with a small crew, right? That you have. I mean, that's that's like a lot of crypto funding is just like that. Like if you back in 2017 did an ICO, like you'd give people money hoping it would work out, but there were plenty which did not. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Trust it. yeah, that's true. So in that but, way, uh, actually, it's good. It's finally good to have crypto people on board, right? Because they're used to such, you know, interactions. And even like most of the crypto projects that's happened with, it's from like Sudan, like anonymous developers right and so this this professor is not anonymous you know it's very clear who he is where he works like i think that that's fairly safe um cool i guess kobe do you have any other questions when it comes to this just for mm -hmm. big yeah i guess uh, the main thing i'm trying to figure out and i know maybe contradicts a lot of like you know science in general being open and whatnot but like i really believe that or at least I would I would want to create uh, to contribute to like a society where scientists earn more money. <laughs> I think that uh, I honestly think that you know they could earn more money and um, and right now I know a lot of them are against it because you know like it, it maybe some of it goes against with like uh, what they're trying to do, which is like to. Uh, discover knowledge and new things but i'm just trying to think about like in if we if we were going to go with this model and i know it's up in the air like i'm trying to brainstorm ways in which like if i fund a project like this cosmos thing how can i as the funder um and and also the uh the scientists i'm funding earn money so like right now it's like i'm giving you money to do exactly what you need and that's it there is no return on my investment so much other than like you give me access to a podcast which is great or something like that but like need, I need we need more more incentive and i'm struggling with that and i'm just thinking like maybe you guys have uh some ideas here one idea which Dali had, I think, is worth mentioning is some of these NFTs can be programmed so future sales go towards some kind of wallet. So maybe like if like an NFT is minted alongside the project 
and like Dahlia mentioned, like 2% of every future sale of that NFT goes directly to the lab that issued it or something. Mm, uh, okay. And so the NFT, like if I'm an investor at the very beginning, I buy the NFT, you know, thinking, you know, maybe the NFT will appreciate in value. And every time it trades, you know, maybe the lab gets a small kickback for that. Mm. That's, that is the investment round, but we don't know how you know the, the 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 population will will take it, right? Maybe actually everybody will be okay with the same format as Patreon and YouTube, right? You you give people money, you don't really ask what for, right? You give them money for comfortable life, so they can can continue doing what they're doing because you want more of what they're doing, right? So. There yeah. is a scientist, right? And you mm -hmm. just want the scientist to like pay their rent and do whatever thing they can do next. And so you're mm -hmm. willing to subscribe and like five bucks per month or something. So they, yeah, they might be on a yacht in the next month. You will know that, but the same yeah. goes for other services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think like that's the other part of it, which is like we want to create like a world where like scientists, researchers, like they get to do the things that they want to do not the things that they have to do because they're just so few funding bodies. So that could be like an incentive uh, by itself. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's good for us that the world has been prepared for the paradigm of content creators, right? And scientists, we can try to convert scientists into content creators, right? You just produce interesting, you know, novel stuff and people like that and they support them. That's huge. Uh, parts of uh, incentives for those supporting content creators is just being mentioned. So, like, here are my Patreons. So, yeah. Yeah. Wait, I don't quite get that, Dragon. Can you explain that a little more? Yeah. So, I know YouTubers that are being sponsored on Patreon usually, I know, post a list of Patreons at the end of the video. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Got it. We could. We could okay, so that might be a big point actually for like super rich people who want their name to be in actual paper, right? There is an acknowledgement section and most journals allow, right? Where you can specifically mm -hmm. name a person and how they help you out with these, you know, money or otherwise. And that can be very important for some people, right? It's like almost yeah. like there is a legit proof I helped humanity in some way, right? So you can also mint an NFT at that point too, mm -hmm. stating mm -hmm. that you are like, yes, yeah, some, like that could be your thing. To, and so it's not so much as a financial incentive, but maybe like an ego thing. Mm -hmm. you know? Like I'm, I was looking at the quantum guys who, who are funding this. It almost feels like, oh, I'm a crypto guy. I made some money in crypto. I have extra money lying over. And then like, I want to see some quantum stuff happening. So I'm going to go invest in this research. Totally. You know, like that's what it feels like in that instance. And so, yeah, maybe we don't even need to think about like, is there a financial return to people yet? Like, maybe mm -hmm. it's too complex, you know? Uh, yeah. I think there's two pieces of this, and this is why the NFTs fit well, is like each user needs to have a trophy case of like, here's yeah. like, I funded 30% of mindfulness research last year, right? Pat yeah, Joyce exactly. did that, right? Um, exactly. And then another piece of it is on every piece of content published on Research Hub, you could have like a, a living list of who owns the token. So like maybe if I want to buy like a piece of like Einstein's like 1940 paper on relativity, right? Like the authorship credit is always changing. So maybe Pat Joyce can go buy and be like the 3000th author, you know, on that paper. Cause like at the, at the post, you know, it's always keeping track of like who owns what portion of the NFTs associated with this project. So you can like get authorship credit and then like credit in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like in the end, won't like all the rich people get all the credits? But that's what <laughs> science kind of is, right? Like the NSF, NIH, like I think there are big funding bodies that if we give them more credit, you know, it's kind of why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, yeah. There, there is uh, one other thing. Um, sorry, Anton, were you going to say something? Because I can. No, 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 no. Yeah, I was just uh, about to say, like, let's say we do go with this model and, like, people can self fund and whatnot. 
seems to me like it might work. I'm trying. I'm trying to think about like uh, going back to the conversation we had in Slack, where at the moment it seems like if you give money to university, they'll manage your money, and there is some like overhead that comes with it, right? You gotta do some things that maybe scientists don't really want to or can do without learning about how to do it. So like if we go with this approach, do you guys think that it might this particular portion of the management of the funds will become a big problem or is it like not something we should really concern and kind of see what happens well if you go with a model no strings attached and there is no management so nobody cares i think i think do, do we know if like oh go ahead Joyce. sorry just to jump in here i think what uh dahlia was describing was basically like i mint nfts i sell a portion i now have one bitcoin worth like what happens to that bitcoin like do i just hold it in the wallet or like thomas has been thinking about stuff like this where maybe it goes into a liquidity protocol and i'm like earning interest on my one bitcoin and withdrawing monthly allocations out like as as i need them um or and- or you lose everything because B- bitcoin <laughs> loses that half its same. value tomorrow Totally. That well, that's that's the risk. I, I guess because DeFi people are doing it anyway, in theory, because it's going up. So I think Dalio like wanted the option to like use the money differently. And and I guess one of the big distinctions here is like if the NIH funds you, it's going to go through the institution. But if you mint an NFT, you have kind of custody over that. And so yeah you have control of the funding it's not like it goes through your lab's bank account and then the institution takes 50 percent. like you have the keys so yeah. i'm sure that would piss people off in like an uber kind of way but it's sort of compelling that you could maybe be earning 20 percent, you know on your grant over the year rather than it i don't know I think, there's something that would piss people off there but i don't, could, I don't know if we should think about that specifically right now because i think it's a little bit too complex um mm-hmm. because it's like it's almost like when you raise money for a startup, you know, like, oh, you have now $5 million. Should you put it into a high yield savings account? Right. Like people are just like, don't even worry about that because like it's kind of a waste of time. So um, one thing that I'm thinking about here is like, really, how do people use the funds? Because like, if I'm trying to, I don't really know the process, but like, I'm imagining if I'm trying to hire somebody to work in my lab, you know, mm-hmm. like I would go through the university because Right. I don't have that set up, you know, the organization set up. So I can't just hire this person. I have to go through the university. But then it's like, I have the Bitcoin. How does the funding work? How does this, like, do I just put it into my, you know, like, does the university give me a bank account I can hire from, like a pay, pay bank? So it's like, there is something here where we have to go back and forth, I think. You know, like, if it's some small stuff, you know, like, oh, I'm buying equipment for my lab, whatever, sure. I think it's fine. But if you're like, oh yeah i just raised like 20 eth and now i want to hire like two people to help me do this thing i think that becomes way tricky like there's way more process that needs to be involved you know yeah that that's one of the biggest things that you guys will have to fight right because uh the thing about great engines and universities they are integrated on so many levels some would even probably say that you know get 20k cash would be less desirable than get 20k grant, right? Because these grants, yes, they take a cut, but the thing is you can use this cut. Sometimes there are returns to fund your students, right? And the one that that's how that's who does the research, right? The majority of research probably in the world mm-hmm. is conducted by grad students. And you get grant students by you know, they enroll in the university, they actually pay money to university, not to you, right? And your grant money can cover your their tuition, then it can cover their like expenses type and stuff like that. And that might not be an option in some universities to just pay students with cash. They're like, we don't do that, right? We need to we need to you know pay to, to admin and stuff like that. Or you will have to pay like 10 times more in cash than you would have paid by a grant, right? Because it's coming through this weird external source that's not, you know, monitored or uh, managed by the university. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. we should just like get in contact with this quantum guy and like ask him how he plans to do all of this stuff. Because if he's doing it, we could just ask him. And we yeah. should have Brian like probably signal boosted by like retweeting, retweeting about it or something yeah. as well. 
That's a good there. idea. Maybe him or some other person. Yeah, uh, it'll be good to learn from them. So that's that's something I wanted to tell Philip, right? Because it feels like it's just me personally. Like I, I don't think my area would contribute from that, right? Because you need an army of you know grad students and everything to do research. You need IRBs. You need access to participants. But there are some areas of research where it's more or less like one two man jobs right you need anyone right you need to hire a supercomputer for, for two hours all right or you need to collect participants online or you need to buy a speedboat and get to the nearest reef and collect the samples or something right so those are probably the types of research mm -hmm. that you guys need to be targeting right because they will benefit greatly from those micro grants which I, I think yeah. should be the first step. At least for now, I think, uh, until we learn from it and maybe can, yeah, it makes sense. And I think like, uh, yeah, I'm, th I'm thinking like out loud, like uh, my guess is that universities like will do a bunch of things for you, as you guys mentioned, like they'll give you facilities to conduct your experiments and stuff like that. And as a result, um, it makes sense why they, collect some kind of a cut too i think anton or maybe someone mentioned there they do collect some kind of a cut yeah uh from the funding it can be like 50 percent at times yeah so okay like you really need the university like if we bypass them then where are you going to do your experiments you're going to do mm -hmm. them at home like yeah so okay i'm just thinking out loud here but yeah the micro thing makes a lot of sense right now anton it could be you if you want Perhaps it would be wise to target the grad students, right? Because they, they, some of them can provide, you know, ultra quality content and they are more money desperate and their, their, their facilities are already taken care of, right? They already have access to their research stations and whatnot, but sometimes they do have, you know, they're short on money, especially the summers. You could probably start a summer funding program or something like that because it's a, it's a thing for many students in America, I know, but maybe in Europe as well, where the university covers your tuition throughout the semester. But during the summer, you're supposed to, I don't know, get money from somewhere. They don't specify. So maybe you could cover those gaps so they can do something, you know, research related that they can post on Research yeah. Hub. So, so we're at like half an hour now, a little bit longer. Um, I just have one more question on this topic. Uh, Anton, do you think it's possible if we started to aim for those kind of smaller projects? Do you think this is something that could transform into larger grants like over the course of a decade? Or will we like always be sort of dealing with smaller stuff when it comes to like trying to fund via NFTs? No, it can be transformed, I think, right? It, it will need to be like a new system built on top of it, right? So you'll, you will need different facilities. You will need people who will review applications, people who will you know, evaluate the budget proposals and stuff like that. But I think it's doable and you can actually use the small grants as a proof of concept type of evidence, right? To be like, we already did that, so why not more? Mm -hmm. And what, what's like, in your opinion, the micro grant and what's the big grants? Um, like 1K, 2K. The micros. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's still. It's nice. uh, decent for yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. if, like in the lab, if we want some like expen, like if we make some expenses or like we want a, a new machine and we just we're just short and we just need little little extra funding, that'd be nice. Mm. Well, why, not include, why not include? Why not include university as uh, one of the beneficiaries of a funded effort? Uh, so they don't do anything to collect the full amount of funding and they can provide all those utilities uh, that you don't have as researchers. So literally, why not just give them a cut immediately and like they will handle all the logistics? It's a great call, Dragon. I mean, it's probably way better to play it nice because if you could get an institution on board and they're making money from it, they will just make everybody use it. Yep. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if, if we could... That's a, it's a great idea to try and play nice with institutions. So you might want, if you, this is your, if you like the strategy, you might look into how the, like the list of grants is formed for your university, right? So some people just private beneficiaries, they are like, okay, I have 5k to spend. How about we make five 
you know, five re rewards or, you know, we'll find five people who will get one K each and they do some sort of project and they actually, they outsource the application process to the university. So that would be nice for you guys, right? Because you probably don't want to read thousands of applications. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but won't you have to pay taxes on that? Like if you use the funding to pay people, like you, you all, you already have to like give a cut, like Dragon said to the university. But then yeah. if you use it, like in Belgium, sometimes in specific kinds of situations, sometimes it gets weird and you have to pay extra taxes on it. So I'm just thinking like with the micro taxes, it's nice, but like, if you really want to use it to like pay people, you might lose it all in the end. Like I. I like the oh. idea, but I don't know if it's really feasible. I don't know if all and also, yeah, yeah, that's tough. Right? In different countries, the donations are taxed differently. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I think I think it it would probably end up being like a ask for forgiveness instead of permission type of situation. But um, yeah, I think like we'd have to you know cross that bridge when we came to it. So we're at like 40 minutes now, and there were a couple other things that I wanted to talk about, but like they're not necessary whatsoever. So yeah, you know, just curious if anybody like uh, wants to stay on for another like five, 10 minutes. Yeah, I just wanted to check like what's the timeline of the NFT proposal? So we're thinking about what we want to build as our next major feature. We're working on the hypothesis evidence graph now and the ELN which like we'll probably get to a pretty like um decent state by halfway through q1 of uh 2022 so we're thinking like during the first portion of like 2022 what should we then start to focus on and um yeah funding is an attractive one just because it makes our token make a little bit more sense um we could generate some revenue from it and i think it would actually help like complete the flywheel of researchers need funding. Like they'll create content in order to get funding. Uh, funders want content, they'll give funding in order to get content. And there's a, a nice positive flywheel that develops. So yeah, that's, it's probably like within the next six months, potentially earlier. Cool. Um, so I guess next thing quickly, uh, Pat or Kobe, do you guys wanna quickly go over the hypothesis, what we've got so far? Uh, yeah, we can share the staging. And this is this is kind of like a intermediate version. So we're making lots of changes. So feel free to like suggest anything that you guys think should be better or different. You have a big monitor, Kobe. On my monitor, it's, it's too squished. I'm not connected to my monitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> can you guys uh, see my screen? Yes. Yeah, it looks good, yeah. Kobe. Yeah, so I think uh, the main thing we wanted to focus on in the next iteration of the hypothesis evidence graph is to improve on a few things, mainly the user experience. Um, <clears throat> let's go to the production site uh, real quick. Show you the difference. Um, yeah, so <laughs> as you can see, like it's it's kind of lacking some direction. It doesn't work in like certain resolutions and it's a bit like confusing, um, like the user interface and stuff like that. So we're in the process of like optimizing it. Um, and this is where it's at. <laughs> uh, we're still working towards like the final version that we want to push out or like not the final version, but the next iteration. Um, and there's like a few particular things I wanted to get your opinion on. So um, basically, um, as you can see now, there is like a, it's like a side by side thing. We would likely change it. It's not going to be like a side by side thing. It's going to be like a single table, but really outlines um, more nicely, like what is a supporting source and what is a uh, rejecting source. One of the things I wanted to get your opinion on 
um, you know, we're working on that. But uh, one of the things I wanted to get your opinion on is is like, should we require people to leave a comment when they like support a uh, a source or reject the source? And also, should we um, should we make it optional? So, like uh, for example, adding a source, perhaps um, you could leave a comment. But I'm more specifically talking about like when you come to this page and you downvote. Uh, you guys can ignore it, the user interface still in, in the works. But let's say I downvote like this particular source. Should I be prompted? to leave a comment about why I've done so, uh, do we think it's going to be beneficial for the feature? Or do we think it's going to prevent uh, people, that's gonna be annoying and prevent people from like utilizing the feature? So yeah, let's start with that. I think it's gonna be the later. Uh, what was the, the latter? You think it's gonna be annoying? It's going to be, it's gonna be uh, it, I think the place where you should maybe ask or even demand for a comment is for the part where people add a source, right? You got kind of like add another window or like add another line where they mm -hmm. describe like why is it relevant? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and maybe yeah. for consent, okay. maybe replace consensus with like relevance or relevant or something like that because consensus is out of context. Yeah, we're going to remove that. Mm hmm. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're restructuring this totally a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, I think so. You, you, you guys, uh, is it fair mm -hmm. to say that like leaving a comment when you add a source is something we should push the user to do? But when you engage with this feature, maybe we'll just let you um, upvote or and downvote like freely without prompting you. Um, another thing I was thinking about is we could prompt you one time and ask you. Do you want to leave a comment and then you dismiss it and we never prompt you again kind of thing? Uh, just oh, an idea. I have a question. Why would you ever add a comment as you're adding the source? Like the source is the reason why you're adding it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's the paper itself that has all the reasons that you're posting it. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe some mix of like, if you don't post a comment, uh, we'll charge you two tokens but if you do leave it, then like it's free because you gave a reason. So maybe some mix of that kind. Yeah, I think I think the comment thing. Um, we're not like super entirely sure like the the value of a comment. We wanted to have uh, a discussion on the source, like, uh, and it can be like an open discussion. Is there any particular specific direction you would think? comments would be valuable on a source like like what type of comment um and you may raise a good point dragon because it's like what type of comment are you going to leave on a source are you going to explain why you um why you added the source and like are you going to quote from that source like what type of discussion do you guys think I, I kind of think Dragon, under, you underestimate how much garbage people will post randomly in there, and how quickly it can become unusable if you don't prompt people to explain themselves as they do it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Anton. So you're saying that uh, like you should be like when you add a source, you should explain why. Yeah. What What is right. the reason for you adding the source? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because. Like some questions that are, they can be posted in the hypothesis, they're not trivial at all, right? And there, there is rarely going to be a paper that specifically answers that question, right? All, it's 90% of the case is going to be something. So it's going to be like, imagine you add the source um, and, and then, um, you know, you add the source and then you say like, oh, this source rejects or supports. Uh, perhaps we will prompt you to and ask you like, how is this source supporting or rejecting the hypothesis? Like explicitly asking mm -hmm. you that question as opposed to just like, here is a general comment box, put something in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, do you guys agree by the way that we should guide the user towards like 
entering a specific type of comment or as opposed to like a general put like your thoughts kind of thing. And I'm talking about at the time you add the source, like. Uh, what, what, what What's really the difference between the two types of comments? I think it's just uh, one type of comment, but maybe right now, like I'm just envisioning like you, we're going to prompt you to add a comment. And if we don't give you some guidance, then two things could happen. Like one, it could result uh, maybe in organically like a really good conversation or it might like no one might actually enter a comment ever unless mm -hmm. we explicitly ask them to. Um, put yeah. something like how is this supporting or rejecting the hypothesis yeah like what is the connection to the to the proposed hypothesis something yeah what like is that? the um okay um thanks guys i know i mean that's like the main thing i wanted to talk about right now i know we're kind of like running uh out of time so maybe I've got, Joyce, like, you, you wanna uh, one remark still like when you've got like the the sidebar i me personally, I would enlarge it a little bit more because it's really like hidden somewhere and it's kind of the consensus of like the whole hypothesis feature. And it looks like, yeah, you see all the like all the um, arguments uh, for and against, but I also want to see what's really the consensus. Um, um, I see. You mean is sidebar? You mean like that area of like yeah, like the, with the green like mm. that you had before like per paper, but now on top like oh, it was yeah. on the right side. Uh, right. You want that to be highlighted more? Yeah, like maybe a little bit bigger because now it's like it's more focused on the arguments, which of course that uh, um, that's what we want, of course. But like I also want the consensus to be like a little bit clearer. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense, uh, Philip, yeah. Cool, very cool. Um, yeah, thanks for all the feedback there. So the last thing that I want to do, if everybody is ready to move on from the hypothesis feature, um, is chat quickly about our mission statement. Uh, we mentioned this like a little bit during our offsite, and we've been talking internally about potentially like what Research Hub's mission statement is going to be. And so we've got it down to four different choices, and we'd love to hear from the community like um, which one out of these four do you think is most appropriate? And then we also don't have to change it too if we just want to stick with Accelerate Science. So. Yeah, just curious what everybody thinks. Like, we use the word community a lot, but to me, yeah, look, like as a scientist, it looks more like something you use on Reddit or like, I, I know we use it a lot, but like bringing people together is more like simple. Um, I think like, I like the one bringing people together to accelerate science, but is that really what research, like what's this accelerating science? I mean, I mean you, you wanna have a catch ratio, of course, but for me, it's now it's still quite vague. Mm -hmm. I kind of have this. I agree with Philip. I have the same feeling. I, it all it feels like that. If you want the catchiness, then just stick with accelerate science. If you want it to be more concrete, I don't think this alternative do it. Honestly. Okay, so you guys think we need to, um, in theory, put in more work into explaining what accelerate science means? Uh, the well, way that I parse uh, these sentences, it seems that uh, like first and third one basically explaining like Research Hub is a platform that is there for people to use it to actually accelerate science. It's not Research Hub itself that is doing the acceleration. It's a platform where people will figure out how to do it themselves. Uh, 
Lining incentives is a very weird one. I'm not even sure how to understand it. And accelerating science is probably the most, potentially the most direct one where like Research Hub is a product that you use to do better science. It's not a platform that you use to figure out a way, like it's what you actually use to achieve a certain set of results. So yeah, my vote goes to fourth one. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's awesome feedback. Does everybody else kind of agree that uh, I think the intention here too is to like create a mantra internally. So when we hire people, like we can build a culture around, you know, I guess our mission. So it, yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to communicate like exactly what we're doing. And I think what Dragon described is, you know, kind of what we would want people to take away from it. So does anybody else have any thoughts before we uh, finally decide? We can, uh, if you go to this website called brilliant.org, we can kind of do like what they do. Right here. You see their, their mantra is like learn interactively, but then they have a statement of what that means. Okay. So then like, you know exactly what it is and then you can tell your friends to exactly what it is. Totally, so it's like, like great research here and then what we're doing. Yeah, I think that combining these two like this makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, I think there's a difference between like the mission statement, just like the catchy sort of one-liner and like something like an elevator pitch that you would tell your friends Like you don't just yeah. tell your friends like Coinbase is built to get open financial system for the world, right? You tell them like, oh, that's where you can yeah, you buy, buy and sell Bitcoin, Bitcoin yeah, and stuff, Bitcoin. right? That's what you can do with Coinbase. It's not really their mission, but that's the elevator pitch you would give to your friends to convince them. So, yeah, I think Accelerate Science is like fine for the mission, but we're kind of lacking a coherent like elevator pitch that people can sort of use to communicate. It's hard yeah, because you have, you have like five missions and some of them are not related. <laughs> yeah, but still, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Thomas said, like, like that's, that's like a catchphrase is nice, but like how we eventually will, like for now, we often invite people, right? Like, on Slack, people join or like, or they, they, they contact you, uh, Pat. And then that's, that's when they join. But like, if I really want to introduce it to like people that don't know anything about it, like, or don't, uh, or, or aren't even looking for it online, then that's what I want. Like, I want people that's, that normally don't really invest uh, their time in that kind of stuff. Why would they do now? Like, we could right. Yeah, it's there is a discrepancy a little bit, right? Because so many activities right now are actually not any, related to accelerating science in any way, shape, or form, right? The 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 the, inter, the collaboration with OSF is not about speed, right? It's about quality and reliability. The interaction and comment section is not about speed it's about like communication right and stuff like that it doesn't come down to speed in many cases so accelerate science it sounds but catchy maybe yeah but maybe you accelerate because you like made the conversation online instead of like like having a, a nice platform like chatting or like having it instead of like mailing each other or having like these kinds of meetings where you have to discuss everything at once. No, I get it. But do you get like do, emotionally, do you get that feeling after you do something in the research hub? Do you go back home and like, yeah, accelerated science today? You know? I, I guess I think that's, that's part of why it's important to have this conversation because prioritizing us, like if you did raise funding through it, would you have more of that feeling? You know, if, like you could get funding where it wasn't before. Mm. I guess accelerate just kind of in my head means like expediting something, right? That was slow before, but now it's fast. It's like getting money doesn't mean that you ma you made it possible, but it d didn't make it faster, right? It's just nothing versus something happening, not necessarily faster. Totally. 
kind That's of a, super helpful feedback. I think uh, I think I agree with your perspective too, Thomas. That we can we can have a mission and then like a kind of marketing statement too makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys for taking an hour for all the feedback. It was super helpful. Um, do you have anything else for us for next week? I see uh, there's someone on top of the leaderboard, but uh, like the the reputation points are a little bug. Because <laughs> yeah, Anton, yeah. you're on top but with two thousand. Oh, am I? Yeah, the reputation and the research coin. Yeah, need needs revision. <laughs> yeah, we definitely Maybe. Need to, we need to address that, and we plan on building like a little bit uh, to help with the power user program, helping to make like comments more discoverable, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I haven't been really active on research, but recently checked. It was really nice. I, I like had tons of notifications. I think that's really like, that's what I wanted. Like. Like now I can go to these notifications, add, start a discussion, and don't have to look up like a couple of months before. So good work, guys. <laughs> Credit to Anton. Anton's doing almost it completely unilaterally. So for sure. Thanks, guys. Okay. Good job. Cool. All right. Well, until next week. See you, everybody. Bye, everyone. See you, everyone. Cheers.